Good morning. Let's begin our service by singing hymn number 329. The heavens declare the glory of him who made all things. Each day repeats the story. Each night its tribute brings. To earth's remotest border his mighty power is known. In beauty, grandeur, order, his handiwork is shown. Hymn number 329. The scriptural will be given by Nancy from New Jersey. Matthew, watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. 1 Corinthians. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will, with the temptation, also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men. Judge ye what I say. Psalms. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, 
nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Let us now have a moment of silent prayer and follow with the Lord's Prayer and its spiritual interpretation as given in the Christian Science textbook. Father, Mother, God, all harmonious. Hallowed be thy name. Adorable One, thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom is come. Thou art ever present. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Enable us to know, as in heaven, so on earth, God is omnipotent, supreme. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us grace for today. Feed the famished affections. And forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And love is reflected in love. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And God leadeth us not into temptation, but delivereth us from sin, disease, and death. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. For God is infinite, all power, all life, truth, love, over all and all. Now let's sing hymn number 379. Well for him who, all things losing, even himself doth count as naught, still the one thing needful choosing, that with, with all true bliss is fraught. Hymn number 379.
Welcome to the Sunday morning service of the Plainfield Christian Science Church Independent. We begin every Sunday morning here at 10 a.m. with our roundtable discussion, which is a bit of a training session in practical Christian science. And we had another really good one this morning, so if you missed it, you really need to hear it. <laughs> And you'll be able to find it on our website, plainfieldcs.com. And it will also be available on our YouTube channel. We have a Sunday school for children that meets at 11 a.m. And that Sunday school has its own teleconference number so that any child anywhere in the world can attend by telephone. And in fact, many of our students are from out of state and they do attend by telephone. So if you don't live in the area and you have a child of Sunday school age, please call us and we'll give you the number and would love to welcome your child to our Sunday school. We have a testimony meeting every Wednesday evening at 8.15 where you can hear testimonies of healings and lives literally saved through the study and practice of Christian science. And we have a nursery available for infants and toddlers for all of our services. We have many websites in many different languages where we send the word of God, Christian science, out over the internet to everyone, every, literally everyone in the world, and often in their own language. And our websites are full of the very finest Christian science literature for you to study and listen to. And it's all free of charge. We don't charge for access to any of our websites. Freely we have received, and freely we give. And there's an excellent article on our English website, which I'd like to point out, entitled, The Stars in the Firmament, by Amy Ferris. Very, very, very good article. Recommend it highly. Everyone is welcome here, and that includes all of you who are listening and participating from around the world. And now we will have the reading of a testimony of healing from the chapter entitled Fruitage in our textbook, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures, which attests to the healing power obtained by studying Christian science. And that reading will be given this morning by Karen from California. Page number 628. Obstinate Stomach Trouble Healed. There is no doubt that by far the greater number come to Christian science by the way of physical healing. But there are those to whom this does not particularly appeal. In the hope that it may be of benefit to some such, and in gratitude for help received, I submit my own experience. Three years ago, I knew nothing of Christian science, aside from the knowledge gathered from the daily papers and current literature. When I thought of the subject at all, it was to class Christian science with various human theories with which I could not be in sympathy, for they seemed to rely upon both good and evil. I had never known of a case of healing and never read the textbook or heard of the journal or sentinel. But I would sometimes see people going into the Christian science church. I was tired of trying to find anything satisfactory in religious belief, for it seemed as if God either could not or would not bring into harmony the terrible conditions existing in human society. I had quit using any form of prayer except the Lord's Prayer, 
and even then omitted the words, lead us not into temptation. How I longed to know just a little of the why and wherefore of it all. Here is where Christian science found me. I was thrown in contact with a dear friend of whom I had seen very little for a year or more, a thoroughly educated woman and a thinker. She told me she had taken some treatments in Christian science for a physical trouble and had become very much interested in the study of science and health with Key to the Scriptures by Mrs. Eddy. She asked me if I would like to look at the book and I said I would be glad to do so. The first chapter, Prayer, appealed to me from the first, and when I came to Mrs. Eddy's spiritual sense of the Lord's Prayer, Science and Health, page 17, my interest was fully aroused. I knew that in a dim way, I was learning what it means to pray without ceasing. Very soon, I bought a book of my own, and with the help of our lesson sermons, as given in the quarterly, I began in earnest the study of science and health in connection with the Bible. I stood very much in need of physical healing at this time, having suffered for several years from an obstinate form of stomach trouble. So far as I know, I gave no thought to the benefits I might derive physically from the study. But I did believe this science held the truth of things, and I was so absorbed in getting an understanding of the principle that I thought very little of myself. After about three or four months' study, I realized that the stomach trouble was gone, and with it went other physical troubles which have never returned. This healing was brought about by the earnest, conscientious seeking for the truth as contained in the Bible and interpreted by our leader in our textbook, Science and Health. I have since learned more of the science of healing and have been able in a small way to help others in need. I have also learned then in living and loving is healing realized. And in reflecting divine love, I have the signs following. When we think of the pure, loving, unselfish life Mrs. Eddy must have lived in order to become conscious of this truth and give it to us, words are a poor medium through which to express the gratitude which her followers feel for her. It is best expressed by obediently following her, even as she is following Christ. H. T. Omaha, Nebraska. The lesson sermon for this morning can be found on page 20 of the Independent Christian Science Quarterly. Subject, man. The golden text is from 1 Corinthians. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. The responsive reading is from James. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let Let no man say when when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. 
But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. But whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This man shall be blessed in his seed. Fairly from Maryland will now read. The Bible, Genesis. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. Exodus. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Second Samuel. And it came to pass in an evening tide, that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. And the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child, And David sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. And it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter, saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle, and retire ye from him that he may be smitten and die. And when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when the mourning was past, David sent and fetched her to his house, and she became his wife and bare him a son. But the thing that David had done Displease the Lord. Matthew. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, After this manner, therefore, pray ye, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
But thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. John. And early in the morning he came again into the temple. And all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down, and with his finger wrote on the ground, as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Have no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. 1 Corinthians, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? Galatians, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, there is no law. Carol will now read. I will read correlative passages from the Christian Science Textbook, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures by Mary Baker Eddy. Man, made in his likeness, possesses and reflects God's dominion over all the earth. Deity was satisfied with his work. How could he be otherwise, since the spiritual creation was the outgrowth, the emanation of his infinite self-containment and immortal wisdom? There is but one real attraction, that of spirit. The pointing of the needle to the pole symbolizes this all-embracing power, or the attraction of God, 
Divine Mind Sensualism is not bliss, but bondage. For true happiness, man must harmonize with his principle, divine love. The son must be in accord with the father, in conformity with Christ. According to divine science, man is in a degree as perfect as the mind that forms him. The truth of being makes man harmonious and immortal, while error is mortal and discordant. Christian science demonstrates that none but the pure in heart can see God, as the Gospel teaches. In proportion to his purity is man perfect, and perfection is the order of celestial being which demonstrates life in Christ, life's spiritual ideal. It is the spiritualization of thought and Christianization of daily life, in contrast with the results of the ghastly farce of material existence. It is chastity and purity which contrast with the downward tendencies and earthward gravitation of sensualism and impurity, which really attests the divine origin and operation of Christian science. The triumphs of Christian science are recorded in the destruction of error and evil, from which are propagated the dismal beliefs of sin, sickness, and death. Jesus was unselfish. His spirituality separated him from sensuousness and caused the selfish materialist to hate him. But it was this spirituality which enabled Jesus to heal the sick, cast out evil, and raise the dead. Jesus knew the generation to be wicked and adulterous, seeking the material more than the spiritual. His thrusts at materialism were sharp, but needed. Jesus' prayer, forgive us our debts, specified also the terms of forgiveness. When forgiving the adulterous woman, he said, go and sin no more. His consummate example was for the salvation of us all, but only through doing the works which he did and taught others to do. His purpose in healing was not alone to restore health, but to demonstrate his divine principle. He was inspired by God, by truth and love in all that he said and did. The motives of his persecutors were pride, envy, cruelty, and vengeance, inflicted on the physical Jesus, but aimed at the divine principle, love, which rebuked their sensuality. <clears throat> the best sermon ever preached is truth, practiced and demonstrated by the destruction of sin, sickness, and death. Knowing this, and knowing, too, that one affection would be supreme in us and take the lead in our lives, Jesus said, No man can serve two masters. We cannot build safely on false foundations. Truth makes a new creature, in whom old things pass away, and all things are become new. Passions, selfishness, false appetites, hatred, fear, all sensuality yield to spirituality, and the superabundance of being is on the side of God good. We cannot fill vessels already full. They must first be emptied. 
Let us disrobe error. Then, when the winds of God blow, we shall not hug our tatters close about us. The way to extract error from mortal mind is to pour in truth through flood tides of love. Christian perfection is one on no other basis. Grafting holiness upon unholiness, supposing that sin can be forgiven when it is not forsaken, is as foolish as straining out gnats and swallowing camels. In a world of sin and sensuality, hastening to a greater development of power, it is wise earnestly to consider whether it is the human mind or the divine mind which is influencing one. Infidelity to the marriage covenant is the social scourge of all races, the pestilence that walketh in darkness, the destruction that wasteth at noonday. The commandment, Thou shalt not commit adultery, is no less imperative than the one, Thou shalt not kill. Chastity is the cement of civilization and progress. Without it, there is no stability in society, and without it, one cannot attain the science of life. You must control evil thoughts in the first instance, or they will control you in the second. Jesus declared that to look with desire on forbidden objects was to break a moral precept. He laid great stress on the action of the human mind unseen to the senses. Evil thoughts and aims reach no farther and do no more harm than one's belief permits. Evil thoughts, lusts, and malicious purposes cannot go forth like wandering pollen from one human mind to another, finding unsuspected lodgment, if virtue and truth build a strong defense. Resist evil, error of every sort, and it will flee from you. Error is opposed to life. We can, and ultimately shall, so rise as to avail ourselves in every direction of the supremacy of truth over error, life over death, and good over evil. And this growth will go on until we arrive at the fullness of God's idea, and no more fear that we shall be sick and die. Soul has infinite resources with which to bless mankind, and happiness would be more readily attained and would be more secure in our keeping if sought in soul. Higher enjoyments alone can satisfy the cravings of immortal man. When the illusion of sickness or sin tempts you, cling steadfastly to God and his idea. Allow nothing but his likeness to abide in your thought. Let neither fear nor doubt overshadow your clear sense and calm trust that the recognition of life harmonious as life eternally is, can destroy any painful sense of or belief in that which life is not. Let Christian science, instead of corporeal sense, support your understanding of being. And this understanding will supplant error with truth, replace mortality with immortality, and silence discord with harmony. Man is God's reflection, needing no cultivation, but ever beautiful and complete.
Let's now have a moment of silent prayer for our world. Let's now sing hymn number 256. The words of this hymn are by Mary Baker Eddy. O'er waiting harp strings of the mind, there sweeps a strain, low, sad, and sweet, whose measures bind the power of pain, and wake a white-winged angel throng of thoughts, illumined by faith, and breathed in raptured song with love perfumed. Hymn number 256.
Let's now sing hymn number 330. The King of love my shepherd is, whose goodness faileth never. I nothing lack, for I am his, and he is mine forever. Hymn number 330. I will read from the Christian Science textbook, the scientific statement of being and the collective passages from 1 John, third chapter. 
There is no life, truth, intelligence, nor substance in matter, or its infinite mind, and its infinite manifestation. For God is all in all. Spirit is immortal truth. Matter is mortal error. Spirit is the real and eternal. Matter is the unreal and temporal. Spirit is God, and man is his image and likeness. Therefore, man is not material. He is spiritual. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because he knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. For we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that had this hope in him purified himself, even as he is pure. So, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart, all ye that hope in the Lord. Amen. <laughs> 